My name is Lynn Boland, and I would um, like to welcome everybody to the first screening of the fall series of the Port Jefferson documentary series. Um, and the series is sponsored by Maya Salon Spa and Wellness. Um, I hope you enjoyed tonight's film, Love It Was Not, and we are here for the q and I would like to first welcome Tom Needham, our moderator, and uh, the host for many, many years, 30 years is it, of um, The Sounds of Film, which is America's longest running themed radio show. Thank you, Tom, for always lending us your expertise to um, talk about these films. Um, I would also like to welcome our guest speaker, Maya Sarfati, the director of Love It Was Not. Maya is Zooming with us from Israel. Um, she also has a new baby. Um, Love It Was Not is Maya's first feature length film. Um, she won an Oscar for the short version of Love It Was Not. Maya is a director, a writer, an actress, and it was as a young dance student that she first heard the story, the amazing story, that is the basis for Love It Was Not. At this point, I'd like to turn this over to Tom and Maya. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, Maya, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, very happy to be here. Thank you for hosting me and for showing my film, of course. Thank you. And congratulations on your baby. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> so uh, Maya, I, I know you made a short film related to this subject matter and you've known about this story for some time. Why did you decide to make this into a feature film? Well, uh, the short film and the feature film are uh, very, very different. Uh, the short film called uh, The Most Beautiful Woman uh, is, is, is about the second generation. Uh, as simple as that. Uh, the climax of the film is a meeting between the daughter of the SS officer and the children of the survivors. Uh, I, I brought Dagmar, uh, the SS officer's daughter, to Israel, uh, and the meet meeting was held here in uh, Mickey's, Mickey's uh, home. Mickey's, she's the daughter of Rosa. And I can tell you it was a very, very dramatic meeting, a uh, very intense meeting. Uh, that raised moral and ethic uh, questions about responsibility uh, and what is the respons responsibility of the second generation and how each side uh, dealt and told the story of the past to his or her children. Uh, and when I finished this film, I won the Student Academy Award uh, uh, as was mentioned. Uh, and when I finished this uh, film, it was clear to me that there's a lot to tell about the, historic sto the historical story, the past story that I haven't told. Uh, and uh, it was clear uh, from the first moment I started working on this film, I, I, it was clear to me that there will be two versions the second generation version and the historical version. Uh, and uh, Nir and I, Nir is my husband and the producer of the film. Uh, uh, we just uh, went on uh, collaborating with uh, the Austrian side and uh, to have a co-production with Austria and to make the, the full length of the, film, of the film. One of the things that you kind of touched on a little bit that I love about this movie is that it raises all kinds of ethical issues. I was wondering when you set out to make this movie, did you already have any kind of preconceived opinions yourself of any of the film's subjects? Well, uh, I, I came with questions, uh, not, not with many answers. I, I knew that one of the big, biggest uh, questions I have uh, and I guess uh, I wanted the audience to ask is, is it love? Uh, 
can you even speak about love in terms of love when you speak about an SS officer and a Jewish prisoner in Auschwitz? <laughs> and can you speak about free will? Um, can you speak about choice? Uh, I, I, I do have an answer now. Uh, I don't think it was love, not from Elena's side. I, I, I don't think, uh, I don't think it, it can be as pure as love. Uh, I do think that along the two and a half years they had the relationship, uh, she had positive, feeling, positive feelings for him, uh, gratitude. Uh, and as one of the survivors says in the film, uh, he treated her as a human being. And it was a very special thing in Auschwitz, a very unique thing. And so I had, I think he had, a, 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 it was meaningful for her. And, and he saved her life more than once. And he saved her sister life and he risked his life for her. But from her side, I don't think you can speak about love on his, him on the other side. <laughs> I have no doubt that he was, he was uh, deeply in love with her till the day he died uh, for all his life. Uh, I have no doubt that he truly and deeply loved her. Yeah. Why do you feel so confident that it wasn't love on her end of the, the relationship? And why did you decide to name your film, Love It Was Not, so that people would go into the film already with that idea in mind? Um, well, uh, Love It Was Not, it's actually a great question because it raises, uh, it, gives me, it gives me the chance to, to, to tell a, a great episode about, uh, about the film. Uh, as, as you know, uh, Love It Was Not is uh, the song that Helena says that she sang uh, in, the, in their first meeting. Uh, it actually, uh, the, the German wording is Liebe uh, war which is, it was never love. But Helena says, translate it as love it was not, and I'm taking her translation. Uh, in his diaries, uh, Franz uh, describes the same uh, situation. And he tells that she sang a, a song that is, that its, word are, its words are, uh, my heart is homesick for your love. So she says, love it was not. And he says, my heart is homesick for your love. Hmm. Uh, to, to be honest, I don't think that neither of these songs uh, was the song that was sang, in the, really <laughs> sang in the, <laughs> in the moment. But I think you can learn a lot about the way each of them wanted to remember uh, or wanted to tell the story to, to others. Uh, I think that uh, naming the film Love It Was Not uh, raises questions more than uh, giving, gives answers. Uh, I can only say that was my meaning uh, and I yeah. hope that the effects it, it creates. In, in real life, it's very easy to judge people and I was curious, uh, historically, how have people viewed um, Helena? And based on your witnessing audiences watching the film, is, is there a consensus in terms of how people respond to her feelings for him or not? Well, to, to answer, to really answer this question, I have to go back. Uh, in the late 40s and early 50s, when the survivors just came to uh, the newborn Israel, um, the Israeli street, the atmosphere in the Israeli street was very tense uh, regarding them and very unforgiving, uh, meaning that uh, they was blamed, they were blamed, because how can it be that you survived? and all the other didn't. What have you done in order to survive? And as a woman, 
what have you done in order to survive? And now imagine Helena in this atmosphere where while she really had a relationship with an SS officer. It was a very, very hard time for her. Yeah, so at first she, uh, she, didn't, uh, she didn't share uh, her past. And in the film, there's this thing when a lady says that she met her in, uh, in Netanya on the beach and she ran away. Uh, and only in the 60s, uh, when the Eichmann trial was held, uh, the atmosphere in the Israeli street was changed and uh, people were really willing to, to listen, to hear what happened and the survivors started to talk and Helena as well. And I can say that from the moment she started, she never stopped. Um, there's a, a family um, myth. I'm, I'm not sure if it's, if it's true, but uh, the family myth says that Helena sat with uh, the, the, the radio, listening to the Eichmann trial, to the testimonies. And at some point she burst in, in tears and collapsed. And that was the moment she lost her voice. And from this moment on, she never sang again. Uh, that's, that's interesting. Just, yeah. Did, uh, did you struggle at all with um, trying to figure out how much of the opinions of some of the other women prisoners you wanted to include in the film or not? Apparently, it's clear that some of them were very critical of her. And um, if you, I guess, if you included too much, that could tilt the way the audience feels about her. So how did, how did you strike a balance in terms of putting other people's opinions about her in your film? Well, uh, I have to share uh, the, um, um, I have to say that Sharon Yaish is my editor. Uh, it's a very joint, um, how do you say? Um, we, did that, we did that together. It was a very, uh, a very open dialogue in the editing room. Uh, uh, measuring each sink, uh, uh, thinking what, it, what is the, um, uh, the impact of it. Uh, and what will be the overall uh, impact on the on the audience? And I, my aim was uh, not to give answers, uh, mm. to give the options uh, to the audience, and for each and every one of the audience to be able to choose for himself uh, his pos position regarding the story. Uh, I used. The, the women in order to give a um, very wide uh, point of view of the, of the story. Uh, it was very hard to locate uh, these uh, women. I sat in uh, more than a year, uh, I sat in Yad Vashem listening to, uh, to testimonies of Auschwitz survivors, mainly uh, women uh, from the first transports uh, that worked in Canada, in the Canada facilities. Uh, it was very hard times for me, uh, listening to testimony after testimony after testimony. I can, I can tell you that I, I cried more than usual back then. Uh, but there were moments of light in these days because when uh, someone mentioned Elena Rosa in France, uh, in her personal testimony, when uh, they did, when someone dedicated precious minutes to this story, it was like, wow. Hmm. Uh, from the point of view of a uh, of a screen screenwriter, scriptwriter, you know, yeah, uh, it was like uh, they gave me um, a way uh, to look to look into the past because you know it's a very bombastic um, headline. An, an affair between an SS officer and a Jewish girl in Auschwitz. Hmm. And these women, they gave me uh, uh, 
they gave it the day-to-day -day feeling of it. How does it look like? How does it sound? Uh, what they said to each other, what he, the ways he helped her, what people said about it, like, you know, a day-to-day -day sense of, the, of this uh, relationship. Uh, I, I managed to locate seven of the uh, survivors who remembered the, the story and to interview them as myself. myself. All other uh, interviews in the film are the product of the very, very valuable efforts of uh, the Yad Vashem archive and the Shoah Foundation archive by uh, Steven Spielberg. Um, I called the woman, the woman chorus, uh, mm. like in the, the Greek tragedy, yeah. uh, the chorus unfolds the story. But there is a very, very important difference because in the tragic, uh, uh, in the Greek tragic, uh, uh, the chorus uh, speaks in one voice. And here it's the contrary. Uh, it's the, um, the difference uh, of the voices, of the, of the way they speak about the story that makes it so uh, unique and powerful. Uh, and on a personal note, I can say that I love each and every one of these women. Uh, they are brave and they are honest and they are full of compassion, and they are nasty, and they're full of envy, and, and they are beautiful. They are. I agree. I agree. You know, uh, here in America, you know, many people have learned by this time that it wasn't uncommon during the times of slavery that slave owners would sometimes sleep uh, with the female slaves. And, um, it took a while for all that to come out in the history books and, and so forth. I haven't heard much about this story here until watching your film. I know other people have. Was this uh, a unique incident or were there many reported cases where Nazis were uh, having relationships with women in the different uh, camps? Well, there's a one big, big difference. It was illegal. Uh, ah. it, if you did that as an SS officer or, or as a German uh, uh, in any kind of uh, position, uh, you risked yourself because it was illegal to have a relationship with Jewish uh, people, uh, men or women. Uh, this, this, this first, first of all, I would say that. Second, I would say that uh, while listening to the testimonies, I, I listened only, I listened to, uh, only to Auschwitz uh, testimonies. Uh, I did bump into uh, one or two more stories that are about relationship between uh, Germans uh, in positions in the camp and Jewish uh, women prisoners in uh, Auschwitz. Uh, but I can't say I, I had the impression that it was a thing. Uh, mm -hmm. It was quite a unique, and I can say that this is why uh, I was able to locate so many people that talked uh, specifically about Helena and France, because it was known in the camp, and it was so unique that people mm -hmm. talked about it. They were like, no, it, it sounds crazy to say, but they were kind of celebrities of Auschwitz. Uh, right. She was known uh, as Franz Wunsch's girl. Uh, yeah. What is the, the lesson of this story? The lesson of the story? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if there's one lesson to learn uh, from the story. Uh, I can say that one of the things that uh, drew me uh, to the story is the ambivalence of the two main characters. Because uh, Franz Wunsch, on one side, he was a sadistic, cruel SS officer who beat, who beat uh, people, uh, men and women. There's this woman on, on, in my film telling that he beat her so, beat her so hard that she broke her, her um, how do you say? Um, public, I think. 
Um, and uh, he did, after my thorough research in Austria regarding the trial, I can say that I have no doubt that he took part in the selection uh, as an SS officer almost on a daily basis. His job was to take all the, pe all the people who didn't uh, made it through the selection, meaning all the sick people, the children, the elderly women, uh, into the gas chambers. That was his job. So this is one side of Franz Wunsch. And on the other side, there's this, I would say, naive, a naive uh, Franz Wunsch, the man that is capable for pure, of pure love, who risked, who risked his life more than once for the, uh, the, women, the woman he, he loved, um, the sentimental and vulnerable Franz Wunsch, and it's the same person. Uh, so if you're asking me about a lesson that I would say that the lesson is, the lesson is that good and bad are not dichotomic. Mm. And, and the ambivalency and this ambivalency of, of, the, of Francis Wunsch uh, character is the thing that we, we need to remember because the monster is human being. Uh, yeah. As you were saying, it, it's not easy to figure out what is good and bad in, in some of these situations. And, you know, one of the things that filmmakers often use to kind of inform their audience how to feel about a certain moment in a film is music. And I, I love the score in your movie. And I was wondering though, what you told the composer to do, because like I said, sometimes the music can, you know, point an audience in a certain direction in terms of how to feel about this character or, or that character. So what did, you, what did you want from the music in your movie? Well, I can say that Paul Gallister, the, this is the Austrian mu uh, musician of, of the film, uh, is a great guy. Uh, is very talented uh, and, and is a great partner. Uh, he has no ego. Uh, he can write again and again uh, uh, options, uh, musical options for the same uh, scene till we'll find the right exact tune. Um, we worked with the uh, samples uh, while uh, I edited with uh, Sharon, with my editor. Uh, we used, um, how do you say, um, temporarily, tempor temporarily um, music, uh, musics, uh, just guides, that's the word, uh, <laughs> with guides. Uh, so. What you do is that the musician, the musician is watching the film with the guides, and now he has to offer you uh, a replacement. And it's uh, very often is very it's very hard moment in the film because you are already attached to the guides. You watch the film so many times, so many times with these guides, with this music. Uh, so when you when you first hearing uh, the new music, it's like oh no 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 no. Uh, but with Paul, it was amazing. It was amazing. It was like he listened to the guide. We talked about the scene. We talked about what is important for me in the scene. What is the main uh, dilemma of the scene? What is the main feeling of the of the of the film? Uh, and he listened to the guide and he made it much better. Uh, he had a very intelligent um, way of making uh, the, the, the music for each scene. Uh, we, we worked with them um, um, 
each character had her own music. Uh, and if you listen carefully uh, in the film, uh, you'll see that each, uh, each character has her own theme, uh, right. musical theme uh, in the film. And uh, it made it very easy. Uh, and he brought it to the table, the, the, the musical theme. Uh, to each character and I, I thought it was a great idea and we tried it and it worked. Well, I know we don't have too much more time, but besides the music, the thing that I, I think everyone's so impressed with is how you brought this story visually to life. And I was hoping that maybe you could just explain a little bit of what you did in terms of using still uh, images and, and video and all kinds of different things to very creatively tell this story. Very impressive. I, I, I can't believe how you did this. Thank you. So I would say it was, it was one of the biggest challenges of making this film because uh, there is so little uh, footage remained from Auschwitz and the little that there is, is very known. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm deeply sorry to say, but it, it's, it's worn out because we know it so well. Uh, so it doesn't um, move us as, uh, as, it, as it used to. Uh, so it was a big challenge. Uh, and it was actually like in, the, like in the films, I woke up in the middle of the, of the night and I woke up my husband, Neil, the producer of the film. And I told him, I know it, I have it. And he was, okay, can you tell me about it in the morning? And no, no, now. Because uh, I realized that I have the answer within the story. Because Franz Wunsch did, did this photo montage, uh, montages, taking Helena's head, placing her on different clothes and different uh, background outside of Auschwitz, imagining the life they could have had together uh, if they would have been together. Uh, and I borrowed uh, this technique and developed it. Uh, and I worked with uh, two wonderful artists, Shlomit Gokhtar and Ayala Talbenda. Uh, and we made this, uh, I can show you some behind the scenes um, pictures. Oh, wow. um, and we made this uh, uh, we called it two and a half days because uh, it's all paper cuts, uh, but it, it play it's placed uh, in layers. Uh, in the first uh, uh, the first stage, Ayelet made a two D uh, photo montage from all from uh, real archival footage. Uh, describing the scene. The second stage was Shlomit, that you can see here on the screen, uh, made, uh, cut it, cut it and made it, uh, placed it on one moment and placed it on a small model of, of stage, uh, as you can see here. And this, the third stage, we took it into the studio uh, and we, uh, filmed it in uh, like uh, like in cinema because it's cinema, <laughs> hmm. uh, and we did all of all kinds of it. Originally, it was uh, supposed to be only something like ten percent of the film, uh, but we we worked more and more, and we find and we found more and more ways of using these techniques, we used water and fire and we uh, shot it from uh, up and from down. And, and it, was, it was an amazing, amazing uh, process uh, making this, uh, this uh, paper cuts uh, miniature. Uh, I can also add, add that, um, there is a very rough feeling of the cutting. 
uh, you can see the paper cuts, you can see yeah. uh, the material. And it was very important for me. This is why we made it. It was very important to me. So the audience, uh, each moment in the film, the audience will be able to distinguish between an illustration, because this is an imaginary, imaginary illustration of mine, uh, of the scene. So, and uh, real historical documents, because there are real historical documents in the film. Uh, and it was very important for me that uh, the feeling of the, of the paper cut will give the audience uh, the opportunity to know uh, what, what are they watching each and every moment in the film. Well, I think you made the right decision. Um, it's such a good point. Um, the old footage people have seen so many times, you know, in other films and, and I was just glued to the screen the whole time because it was just visually so interesting. And um, that, that was just a great, great choice. Well, I guess everyone wants to know when is this going to be turned into a, a feature film? <laughs> is that in the works? Uh, I can I can tell yet. Uh, maybe. Don't know. Really don't know. Maybe. <laughs> is that something that you would like to do yourself or would that, no. is that something? No, 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 no. Uh, it was a very, very long five years working on this uh, film. Uh, re uh, taking Auschwitz with me uh, each and every day. And my next project won't be about the Holocaust. I, need I know you said you want to leave it up to everyone to make their own, uh, you know, uh, to their own opinions about these different people in the film. But I was curious, what's your final opinion about France after spending all this time working mm -hmm. on this? As far as I know, France never uh, uh, regretted, do you say that, regretted? Yeah. Uh, anything. Uh, there, is a, there is one sentence he's writing in, in one of his letters that blowed my, man, my mind. He says, if we have, if, what, what, the, what would, would it be like if we have won the war? I, I do wonder what the world would have been like. Yeah. Uh, I know that he, he had Mein Kampf uh, in his home uh, till the day he died. Uh, I don't think Helena changed him. I, I think he loved her specifically and helped her specifically. I don't think he was a good man uh, that tried to change the world. I think he fell in love with a very beautiful young woman in Auschwitz. Yeah. Well, Maya, thank you so much uh, for this discussion. And I want to wish you continued success with the film. And uh, we're going to send it back to uh, everyone at the Port Jeff Film Festival right now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for hosting me. It was great talking to you, thank you. I just wanna say <laughs> that I wanna to thank Tom and Maya um, for a wonderful Q and A. Um, we we're so happy that we were able to have this film and uh, so happy to have both of you here to add more background to it. So best of luck and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.